Hello, everybody, and we are live here on Plus One EXP. My name is Tony Vicenda. I'm Chief Alchemist here at Plus One EXP. We're a weird little brand that multi-classes in tabletop game design, beard, and skin care alchemy in the Bardic College of Content Creation. Our hope and desire is to help amazing designers find great players who love their games and help amazing players find great designers whose games they can love. We do that in a lot of different ways, but my favorite one is actually just sitting down with those designers, talking to them about what's happening in their life, in their work, what got them into games, and answering any questions uh, you have in the chat. Uh, today, we are doing that with some folks who I, uh, one who I know very well, one who I'm very excited to get to know, uh, and that's Jay Dragon and Lily J. Harris from Possum Creek uh, Games, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the work that they have coming up uh, from an amazing project, but rather than me telling you about them, uh, I'm going to have them tell you about themselves. Uh, uh, but Lily, why don't we start with you? Tell people who you are, what you do, where they can find you online, um, and any of the other interesting and wonderful things about you that you think they might want to know. All right, cool. So hello, uh, my name is Lily. I am from Southern Maryland. I'm a cartoonist. I'm a writer. <laughs> right now I work at a library. <laughs> it's always the spiel, you know what I mean? Like, who are you? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I'm a cartoonist. I'm a writer. I use the issue pronouns. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at uh, Lily, the letter J, and Harris. And I was a writer for Yezebus, <laughs> Bed and Breakfast. We're each going to use a different one of the pronunciations. Yeah. That's the goal. Uh, <laughs> we get a perfect rotation um, going. Jay, why don't you tell people about yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jay Dragon. Uh, I'm editorial director at Possum Creek Games. I'm a full-time game designer and publisher. Uh, I live in the Hudson Valley. Uh, you can find me at jdragski. Um, I am the most notable J Dragon. So if you look up that name, you can you'll get there. Um, and I am also uh, one of the writers and project manager for uh, Yaziba's Bed and Breakfast. <laughs> uh, for people who are not familiar with uh, Yaziba's, why don't you tell people a little bit more about what this? Um, I think. Uh, complex but also very beautifully forward and accessible game is um so uh, yazabuzz is a uh, slice of life role-playing game uh combination kind of like a a combination game slash non-linear like series of interlocking games slash non-linear book um where you play as this group of great characters uh many of whom have been very well fleshed out by Lily uh, and kind of helped figure out a lot of the arcs and such. Um, and you play them through these different scenarios. They grow over time. Uh, and it's a big sprawling series of adventures, right? Is that, that covers it, right? Like, yeah, honestly, that was really succinct. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I feel like I've been like, I've been practicing just getting it done. That was even like longer than I wanted to be. I wanted to mm. get on like five words where I can just like hit you with them. But I, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I um no, I love it. I've had a chance to play it. I'm looking forward because we're going to play it uh, some more next month. Uh, we'll get to play another little taste of it. Uh, but I'm very excited about all the things happening um, in it. And so if y'all haven't had a chance to check out this game yet, uh, learn more about it. Uh, there is a link in the description down below, but I'm also going to drop it here in the chat here on uh, on Twitch so that y'all can see it. If you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, it's in the description uh, but that's tinyurl.com slash Yazabas BNB. Um, and you'll be able to find more information about it. Sign up to get notified uh, when it goes live. We're going to dive more into that, uh, the move off of Kickstarter and some other things uh, in just a little bit. But um, I'm going to want to start. It's it's Zine Month. Um, and that means that there are hundreds of creators right now who are creating small zine length games. If you don't know what a zine is, you're out there watching. It's a book uh, roughly about this size that usually has RPG or RPG related content. Zines actually can have anything, but the ones that are launching right now have RPGs or RPG related content, and they're launching across uh, Itch, uh, GameFound. Um, there are some that are on Kickstarter, but Zine Month is a grassroots organization to kind of decentralize away from Kickstarter um, because of a lot of different things, some of which we'll get into. Uh, and since a lot of those are smaller first time creators, um, I asked Jay and Lily to pick a couple games that stood out to them that we could talk about that they were excited about. So we're going to do that first and then hop in a little bit more. 
more. I'm super excited to hear what the, you, each of you all think about some of the different games uh, you picked. Um, but we're going to start, uh, Jay, with one of yours. We've talked about this one actually already uh, on stream once, but it's a project I absolutely adore. So I wanted to talk about it again, and that's Banda's Grove. Can you tell us a little bit about Banda's Grove and what caught your eye for it? Yeah, so Banda's Grove is kind of like, it reminds me of like, I'm um, watching people play a lot of Slime Ranchers or like Stardew Valley. It's this kind of great, like, collaborative, like, interdimensional garden maintenance game, effectively, that's like, what if you have to take care of this, like, wildlife preserve <laughs> that also sits at the nexus between worlds, and there's all sorts of weird magical things going on, and, like, it's very much, like, I adore it when you have, uh, like, fantastical settings, but the stories are about the mundane day to day. And I really like that Banda's Grove is kind of all about like, you know, kind of engaging with this very magical world in this very day to day way based around the rhythms of it. Also, it's like a cool map making thing. It just think it's really neat. I'm really excited for it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I really love this one because a lot of, like, we're seeing a lot of, um, of like OSR and trad games that are incorporating better story game, like narrative tech mm -hmm. into them. And Bandit's Grove actually does a little bit of the opposite. It's a really cool story game that incorporates a little bit of like OSR hex mapping tech into it that I think tickles my mm -hmm. brain in a super fun way. Um, Lily, had you had a chance to check this one out at all? No, and I'm glad you bring that up because uh, full disclosure, I do not typically come from a gaming background. Yeah, yeah and so I think that was a really interesting reason for me i think jay for like seeking me out because i did not from a ttrpg background the most like rpg i would consider myself doing is like very like paragraph prose heavy like role play with like other people um like written role play um so looking through this list when i was trying to find one i was basing it off of everything else uh that i've experienced which is like comics making and just strict writing where i was like oh um so I didn't even think about it in terms of playing it myself, but Pilgrimage of the Sun Guard is the one that really caught my eye. Yeah. That one looks mm -hmm. so interesting. The aesthetics of it are really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and Amanda P., the author, is another person. I'm in Philly, so are they. Um, and so we've got a chance to interact a lot recently. But I love their art style on this also, too. Like, mm -hmm. the color okay. scheme, mm -hmm. like that bright, warm, like, orange and red, especially for something that's got a little bit, some actual, like, grimdark elements to it as well. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very, very cool. Um, mm -hmm. And so um i'm also like we have we just launched a solo game review channel so we've got a, a person uh named armanda who's an argentinian creator who makes solo okay. games this is on their list that they want to play nice. uh also too on stream so hopefully we're going to get a chance to feature this one uh sometime soon amanda if this is the first time you're hearing about this because i haven't messaged you yet we would love to feature your game on stream <laughs> so <laughs> soon. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a solo prompt journaling game. Uh, I love this. I think for people who are like writers and haven't done a lot of of, of um, like group role playing, solo games are a great intro to that because especially if you've got an art background, some of them are art based, some of them are writing based, some of them allow space for both of those things. And it's just very cool uh, part of the RPG space that we're going to see a whole lot more coming out now. Um, awesome. Uh, uh, who had Fall of Home? Was that Jay? Was that you, or was that, that me? Awesome. That was it's actually by a friend of mine named Joe. Um, and I really like it. Uh, it's a really, it looks like a really gorgeous game. The uh, the art is going to be partially by Connor Fawcett, who did some of the art for Wander Home, and it's like a very like aesthetically interesting looking game. It's also like about traveling through ruins together, which is I don't know. I just think it's so like. Like, that was, like, it's very, like, um, the sort of thing that I wish I had written. You know what I mean? Like, you see something, and you're like, God, I wish that was my idea. Yes. It's, yes. it's got that vibe to it. Um, yeah. And it's really cool. Yeah. Um, I, uh, we got to play a little while ago uh, uh, An Altogether Different River by uh, Aaron Lim. And um, I. Oh, that game's great. It's great. And this has some similar themes themes 
but a very different feeling tone to it. And yeah. so it made me it made me really excited to pick this one up and try it out. Uh, this I, mm-hmm. this one and uh, Tending were very high on my list when I was looking at kind of my top games mm-hmm. for uh, Zine Month. Tending ended up making the list. This one didn't, but I was very excited about this one. I've been um, watching a lot of Jacob Geller's videos about um, like Shadow of the Colossus and The Last Guardian and like these these uh, video games. And like, it has a similar aesthetic of these like very beautiful architectural I don't know just elements that I I I love architecture. So I'm like, hey, <laughs> nice, uh, awesome. Uh, and then we've got uh, more blueberries. Uh, uh, sorry. We've got abominations, uh, I think, uh, which <laughs> yeah, is yeah, that's which not, is yeah. moreblueberries.itch.io is the uh, is Elliot Davis's uh, handle, but Elliot's the creator. Uh, tell us Lily, really, a little bit about abominations. Okay, so as I was going through this list, <laughs> I think I was telling you before the stream started. I was like, this is a very sobering <laughs> personification of myself, <laughs> like seeing this list I picked out. But this, it just looks so great. I mean, the byline is literally, uh, you create and battle lab grown monsters of your own design, um, which mm-hmm. can veer any sort of way, especially who is the person on Twitter? I should know this if I'm saying their name, Tre- Trevor Henderson. Who's yeah. Become, yeah, like so prolific in monster creation. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it just reminded me of all the different things you can make and all the different lore you can make about these creatures. I was so endeared. I just peeked it's I just peeked the page a little bit and it the one of the lines in its description is um they told you to stop playing God. I said who's playing and spliced another genome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> me so, playing Sims at 12 years old. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll also say like I I had I just cruised by this one earlier. I didn't notice this the the shot they have of the table with the mm. scrabble tiles and the character sheet really up. It's a really good shot mm-hmm. for one thing that kind of it's it's a like it, mm-hmm. it draws me in really really well. But I just I hadn't noticed the Scrabble tiles before. This is a very very cool and unique generation process. I am the only. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Oh, the only other game I know that uses Scrabble tiles is Jenna Moran has been working on uh, something where I think it's about like you're these people living on these rooftops and. The Scrabble tiles are similar to like the rain that falls from the from the sky, which I thought was very poetic. Mm-hmm. And I feel like like Scrabble, maybe like I don't know, maybe the next big thing, Scrabble tiles. Maybe we're done with Jenga and it's time for Scrabble tiles. Bring back know. Lincoln logs. <laughs> Bring, Bring back Lincoln <laughs> logs. <laughs> Let's make it. Where's my goddamn mousetrap RPG? <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. No, I, yeah, because it, it's doing some really cool things. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up because, like I said, I looked at it early on, but there's a lot of things that didn't jump out to me. Um, and I, that's one of the reasons I love finding out from people, like what projects just stand out to them because there are hundreds right now. And so like, you just get to see so many new cool things when you invite other creators to tell you a little bit about it. Um, let's talk about, uh, also we talked about this one once before the station, uh, but it is a very cool concept. Jay, this is one of yours, I believe. Uh, I mean, the station is like my shit so much. Like Pidge is an incredible designer. Uh, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced their name there. Um, but like it's such a stunning game. Um, the art actually, the artist for the station is also working on Yazebas. Shannon Cow is uh, one of the artists for Yazebas Bed and Breakfast, and um, uh, they are also the artist for the station. It is a game where uh, you play as a group of people traveling on by train to this train station, and the game is about collaboratively like creating the landscape you're traveling through, which is just I don't know. It's like poetic and surreal and interesting and i'm very very excited to get my hands on it i'm just like oh, give me that let me <laughs> let me pretend to be on a train please that's all i want from rpgs i've i've tried to put trains in so many games and it's never like there are no trains in yuzeva's bed and breakfast there's no trains in wander there's no trains in sleep away what happened <laughs> where did they go <laughs> why are they there uh and finally we have the mall yes Okay, so it was kind of hammered into my head in terms of when you try to pitch to like a big publisher or anyone with money that you would want to couch your project as like, it's like X meets X. And I was always on the fence about that. But I fell for it because reading, um, what is it? It's the thing, but it's set in a mall. I was like, that's great. You've got me. It's <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I, I know why it's probably not, but it kills mm. me that the mall madness 
like remashed image uh, that they have like halfway down the page is not their like splash. Image. <laughs> like I would have paid to have an artist re-rendering of that that was very suggestive. But like God. the Eldritch Horror meets um, the game that your brother pretended not to play of yours when you were mm. uh, when you were in, okay. in elementary school. Uh, is very good. Liminal Horror has got some really cool stuff coming out for it. Uh, Goblet Archives, who's the designer on this, has been doing some really great community work also too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've loved seeing how, like, as they've gotten some of the funding done, uh, the the some of the preview stuff has gotten fleshed out on this one also. I'm very Ooh, excited about it. Exciting. So exciting. Yeah. Do what? I was just saying exciting. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, um, yeah. Uh, I have one I want to talk about, uh, okay. and that is, um, I guess I open it up. It's over actually on games on tabletop, and I didn't send it over to y'all. I'm going to drop it in our mm-hmm. our chat over on Discord real quick, which I should have done earlier. Let me take a look. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, this is the first one that we've looked at on stream that's on games on tabletop. There's a few of them. <laughs> games on tabletop is an EU-based like um, crowdfunding uh uh, platform. We just haven't seen get a lot of use in the U.S., but there's a number of projects there. Also, the creator of this one, Comb, uh, did um, is based out of France, and so um, oh, it's, it's it is art. good for them. But yeah, it mm-hmm. is it is very much like a Fraggle Rock Muppet Saturday morning cartoon <laughs> vibe. Oh my uh, god! The game <laughs> this, yeah. the sad pigeon with the clawed shirt. I was on. just <laughs> staring at the sad <laughs> pigeon. Big head with nothing in it. Oh, that oh. poor baby. <laughs> There is just a bad tempered but selfless pigeon. Yeah, there is there is just so much good on this. The art's amazing. Uh Combs uh Two Summers was one of my my top favorite zines from last year uh for mm-hmm. Zine Quest. And I'm just super excited to see uh what they end up coming up with. Uh, but I'll drop the link to this one as well. Uh I'd encourage people hey. to go check it out. Mm-hmm. And the stretch goals look great. I know some of these folks. <laughs> right? I was just like, I'm like, hey, Melville, hey, Ray, hey, Grant, nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, this looks sick as hell. I'm a little, I'm a little upset. Um, I am, I am lined up for Jim Creek Game whenever they are funding Duck Borg, uh, which is their uh-huh. Ducktales Merkborg hack to write the Darkwing mm-hmm. Duck uh, stretch goal for that. Ray is getting to write mm-hmm. the Darkwing Duck stretch goal for this game uh darkwing duck oh, being no. um one of my favorite childhood cartoons and so mm-hmm, um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but you know uh it's fine it's fine i it's I, fine. It's fine. you know i I, know. I always like when there's more darkwing duck in the world than, mm-hmm, rather mm-hmm, than less so this mm-hmm. is feathered adventures uh, i'm super excited about it um also we have one up right now um uh over on game found it's the only one on game found which means it's super lonely and absolutely <laughs> would love your support uh which i didn't even get ready to pull up uh, so check Your out thing. check out ttrpg.link slash 13 hunters. Um, uh, Roll for Felicity was like, oh my God, I didn't know about Duck Borg. Um, I, I love that. Yeah, D-U-K-K-B-O-R-G. We played it on stream a while ago with uh, with Dan. It's super delightful, but it's Grimdark Merc Borg set in, uh, in uh, the setting and with the, in the style of, uh, of DuckTales. And I played... Doctor, I don't remember what my name was, but it was Doctor something Esquire, and I was a doc. Uh, I was a person pretending to be both a doctor and a lawyer, um, and uh, it was great. But thirteen hundred is such an interesting approach to work for. <laughs> it, yeah, it was great. Um, uh, thirteen hundred is a system agnostic set of uh, bounty hunters that you can drop into uh, any game that you want. It's got tremendously breathtaking visual design. Um, all of it's done by Nuclear Obelisk, so we partnered with them for marketing on this one. We're hosting it and co-publishing oh, it, yeah. uh, but it's been all of their project. I would really love to see it get more support. Uh, but they did the Power Words magic system last year, which was one of the most elegant alternative magic systems to the point where I was just like, I was like, nuclear, I, I just want you to write a game around this. Like, I don't want to drop it into other other trad games. I just want to be a game about cool wizards using power words to cast spells. Mm-hmm. Like that's what mm-hmm. I want. And so uh, they just do tremendous visual design. It's a really cool project. Um, but uh, oh, yeah, I haven't heard about this at out. all. So thank you. Well, there you go. TTRPG.link slash 13H. That said, I'm sure most of the people in the chat are like, these, these are all great projects. This is not what we came to hear about. <laughs> we came to hear about a, uh, an, an infinitely expanding, uh game experience with um with cozy slice of lies a great cast of characters um and uh set in its own 
uh, multiversal reality. So um, and no trains, no trains, no there. trains, no trains. This yet, hey, maybe we'll get enough money on Indiegogo. Yeah. And then <laughs> it's it's going to be the train goal. Like it's going to be, you know. <laughs> At, uh, at one million dollars, we will add trains. Um, we will find a, a spot for a train, and there will be a backer level that for ten thousand dollars you can play on a train. Um, <laughs> a cross country road trip. We'll book, uh, we'll book an Amtrak just for you. Um, the uh, no, I am. I've been. I've been excited about this project for a lot of different reasons for a while. I'm very excited to to dive into it. Uh, a couple things I want to talk about before we we do that though uh well you already mentioned this um mm -hmm. but people people probably know jay um if they're here from from wander home from sleep away from from a lot of the di design work that jay has already done um you mentioned already like you're not a games person you're a writer uh and an artist and so i want to know for you uh as you've kind of gotten gotten deeper into the space as people are like tell me about the rpgs that stand out to most you about zemo uh what's what's been some of the things that have been kind of exciting or surprising to you as you've kind of entered a little bit more into the game space Ooh, that's a very broad question no it's not broad because i have an answer for it i mean that's how i was like Ooh. Ooh. no like what it was is i think i hmm uh not to view games as something where it's like I don't know, when I would see people play D and D particularly, I only sat in on two D and D sessions. Um, and every time it was friends like wanting me to go into the fold and, and lose myself in it. And I would just sit there and draw, but I would not like participate, participate. Well, I should say in terms of making a character. Right. Um, and with this, seeing how it's done, I, I think it's it feels like it's less limiting. Like it feels like it doesn't necessarily have to be um kind of a strict magic-esque thing i don't know if i'm making sense i think i came in with my own biases as to what gaming was um no I, that makes sense. I like that though because it's also i think to a certain like it totally makes sense in a way that a lot of mm. a lot of things in this space do but in a way that also um i think is the opposite of what people might expect right like D and D is often pitched as for good or for bad that you can do anything and it. it's totally open go nuts go crazy mm. and whether or not that's true we'll set aside for a minute that's the approach a lot of people have, but we do have these fantasy tropes and ideas built up in our head around it. Yuzibas is is a set cast of characters, so it's actually like it is like these are the characters, right? This is this is the cast, and and it's a set crew with some with some rotating guests that are going to come in. Um, but for you, the the that was a lot more freeing because it was outside a lot of those preconceived notions. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I didn't have to know what a tiefling was, and I still don't. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but no, <laughs> like not to be mean, but honestly, it was just really beneficial to say like this is approachable. You know what a teenager is, like you know mm. what this cyborg is. We can add these fantastical elements onto it, but it's already based on what is already not that surreal to begin mm. with. It doesn't have its and, own jargon yeah. built up around it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, what's great having Lily on board is having someone who's not in the RPG world means that like the way you approach stuff is just with a much fresher eye. Like mm -hmm. I think oftentimes like the way people write for and about games is very different than uh, how uh, I think, you know, like any other <laughs> approach is done, right? Like, you know, like you're in comics, you've also done writing. And like, I think that, you know, like you, what you were kind of able, what you were able to bring to the table was that like, you know, like, like I remember one of the first things you wrote was a, a chapter, which unfortunately didn't make it into the book, but it was like kind mm -hmm. of like a one pager about uh, like, hey, kid getting a cold and then yes. becoming too polite. <laughs> yeah. And that's just like such a thing that like you don't see in RPGs. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you're able to, like, I think it freed you up to just immediately start writing stuff where it was like, there is no concern about like oh this has to be utility first right like this could be good prose and then we can figure out how do we work the utility in with this and that was mm -hmm. what was really i don't know that, that's why i was that's why like when we were building the right team i was like i want one person who's never done an rpg before on this team <laughs> and, and then like mercedes acosta just bursts in like the green goblin and i'm like <laughs> spider-man's <laughs> grandma praying <laughs> literally i like i like i was talking to mercedes we were like hi mercedes and they were like when you want a fourth person and mercedes was like i know who it must be and i was like i trust your judgment <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and Jay, that goes to a point, like, I, I remember you talking about um, when we were when we were at PAX, like, we were talking about 
the system or the mechanics or like the all the hacking conversations that come up around this because um yeah. like I, I think for me one of the most like it doesn't even necessarily sound like a huge compliment one of the most uh complimentary things i can say about a game is that it's a singular experience like um mm -hmm. i'll talk very clearly about like crispus set when Chris does like a, a Merkborg adventure, it doesn't feel like a Merkborg adventure. It feels like something Chris wrote, it, which is a lot of time people are going for like the uh, the grim dark aesthetic and trying to match what Stockholm Cartel does. Chris will go off in a completely different direction. Um, for as we as we looked at Yazabas, it is it is uh, right now going to be a very singular in the experience of what it is. But one of the things that you mentioned was the mechanical systems are really not the system of Yazabas. It is the okay. prose and the art, and that is actually like the heart of how you write and create. Zebas is not through here's the system mechanics that we're putting together and here's a couple kind of design concepts that we keep in the back of our head but morely more here's what we're writing and here's the art that goes with it and that's actually the core of the game can you talk a little bit more about that yeah, for people who aren't familiar with kind of the structure of, of Yezbas, just to kind of do it in broad strokes, uh, there are these episodic chapters which contain both like a page or two pages of prose uh, and then also mechanics for playing out that chapter. And like the prose is kind of the on-ramp into the chapter itself. Um, and then you pick characters to play as and then you play out that chapter. Um, and the thing about it mechanically is that every single chapter is just very different, right? Like, uh, Tony, when we played together, we were flipping coins and like consulting a menu, uh, cause we were at a, at a cafe, another chapter, you might be laying out cards from a deck and like, or maybe you have to like, you know, navigate this like in universe, you know, guide to different kinds of mushrooms or like, uh, you know, like swim around a giant lake or something like that. And like have it like a hex crawl where you're like, you're like paddling a boat through a flooded town. It just, it's just like, it's, we, we, like every single chapter is very, uh, like it's, it's its own mechanical system. And it's held together by this meta structure of like stickers and like journeys that kind of allow the characters to grow from one chapter to the next as you play them and people, different people play the same character. But it means that the mechanics like are not the core of Yazeba's Bed and Breakfast. Like the 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 heart of the game, like you could play, you could you could take Yazeba's Bed and Breakfast, you could jettison all the mechanics, you could attach on a totally new set of mechanics. And like we're even talking about that for an for a road trip expansion where it's like it's not chapter, it's not episodic at all, it's not chapter based, it's a totally different structure. Because you can just do that, right? Because the mechanics are not the heart, the mechanics are this peripheral thing that you can swap in and out. The heart of it, I think, are the characters, the relationships, and the place they live. Yeah. Um, I, I, and, and that's like, I think that is such a sharp way to do it. Like, it, and it's like right now, right? Just finishing up writing the SRD for um, for Down We Go and Together We Go Systems. Like I'm like all the tech. I mean, it's 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 good basic minimalist OSR slash post OSR tech, right? Um, the heart of what makes that game work is the unitive design and the number of voices that came into de designing those procedures that was over 20 people from across the globe um, who got to speak into this very minimalist reality. But that unitive concept and the, the table brewing and what happens at your table and the narrative process that emerges from that is 100% what the game is leveraged to do. And, and my statement was like, if you're not doing that, like if the game you write is, is not doing that, it's not a game that's using this system, right? Like if you're not inviting players to have these types of conversations at a table, even if it's just around mm -hmm. the conceit of dungeon crawling, um, mm -hmm. you're, you're not making this game. You're making something else. It's, it's similar, but not the same. And mm -hmm. I, so, but it was a lot, what I was thinking through that reflections on some of your conversations about Yuzebas that really kind of brought that to light in my mind. So I think it's such a mm -hmm. great, uh, a great piece to this game that a lot of people are missing. And I, again, I think, this, the statement of like, hey, you know, we want to invite somebody in who is never, who's not a games person, who isn't going to think about this mechanically, uh, but is going to come in and just just write beautiful things that allow that to take place, um, is such a a beautiful place to be at. So, like, Lily, for you, you went from being like, hey, I've I've set I've set in some some D and D sessions to hey, I, now I'm I'm writing this game. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about kind of the play experience, but for you, has has it have you seen that kind of be a very 
have you seen the realization of that on your side? Like, what has that looked like for you as you've stepped in? And it's like, you are essentially designing a system, even if, even if you're writing, um, I don't even know how to exactly pose the question I want. I think, I wanna, I <laughs> I'm, think what I'm, I'm trying to ask it. I'm is, parsing it. <laughs> I think what I'm trying to ask is within that context of like the pros being design, mm. are there things that you're thinking about as you're writing chapters that are distinctive and specific, or are you just like, no, here's the thing that happens next, right? Like, I'm, I'm a little bit curious about that mindset. You know, I get you now. That's a good question. Um, actually, yeah, I think after I began to hear more about the game and actually see playthroughs of people testing it out, I specifically wanted to make certain chapters where I'm like, oh no, this is going to be, I like, I knew it was going to be emotive, but I wanted to really mm -hmm. make it a little more visceral. And so I think an interesting thing about the game also is that in playing it, um, at least from what I've seen, at least, it seems that people have actual genuine reactions to playing through their characters at the tail end of it. So they might start mm -hmm. a little like trepidatious about, well, you know, I'll just make a character. And at the end, they're incredibly invested. And so when making these chapters, I wanted to put enough dips in it at certain points where it's like, okay, mm -hmm. um, this is what Gertrude might be going through at this moment that's like incredibly heartfelt to some degree, or this is what like Amelie might be going through. Um, in order for these potential new characters that are interacting with them to have that same release, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One day I will stop talking and end it with, if that makes sense, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I feel like one of the things that like, I feel like is, has always been a challenge for me when writing mm. the, the kind of the chapter work you've been doing a lot of is that it requires like, like you're not writing the full story. You're writing like the first half of the story and yeah. then telling the players to finish but i feel like you've done a good job with like making like each chapter feel like it does both contain those like dips and rises but also leaves kind of the emotional space for the players to then continue with i don't mm. know that's good to know i feel like in all of my personal work i don't know if you all have had this um <laughs> this exact emotion but when you take stock of what it all is that you've done, whether it be like comics or drawings or something, mm -hmm. I'm able to see themes in my work that maybe other people can't see. And so mm -hmm. I notice that in a lot of my work, it ends on like, a not a cliffhanger, but like a dot, 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 a maybe, like mm -hmm. some level of suspense. And I always kind of saw mm -hmm. that as a detriment. Like, do I not know how to end things? Um, and so I'm glad it's beneficial <laughs> that in this instance. <laughs> no, it's great. Yeah. It's, 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 like, it's like you get to like, you get to write, you get to like write this and then say, you know, and then say to the players, like, what happened? What's, where's the rest of it? What happens next? And like mm -hmm. the cliffhanger element feels good, I think, because when players go to play, it means like, oh, there's a cliffhanger. I want to, as the player, say what the next step is. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I love that. I think for me, and, and it, I think it's such a, it's such a, a mind bending project to even think about how the design works. Um, and while again, while it being like I said, it's one of the the classic things, and I think it it matches the tone of the game perfectly, right? It's it's a it's a bed and breakfast uh, that that you walk up to, but also it's kind of endlessly unfolding with as much rooms as it needs for whoever happens to show up there. Um, like as you're going through, there is this kind of infinite quality to it, but it's very it's very approachable and that feels also like what the design process must be like, right? It's like here's the simple things we're gonna do. But it creates this kind of um, this unfolding context context for how things move forward. It seems like it would just get out of control at a certain point. Like for me, I try to imagine. Okay, <laughs> so you're you're writing these chapters, and you're like, yes, we're we're doing dot 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 players. You finish the second part, but then you're picking back up somewhere, right? Like, and and that somewhere is varied. Like you, the chapters don't necessarily happen in order. They happen they happen in different things. You're building a binder as you go through. That's kind of cataloging your world there's legacy game mechanics where you're actually cutting things mm -hmm. out writing writing on character sheets and prompts and other stuff like that and that's that's changing your the experience of zebas that's that's your tables or your your communities um like there's there's a lot of things that are happening within that um that that I, like i think for me a lot of it becomes like how do you consistently pick back up in that space? And that's maybe also mm -hmm. not even just a design question, but also like mm -hmm. a GM question. If I'm gonna, if I want to play this game with my friends at home, how do I, how do I do that? Does that make sense? I'll, I'll jump in super quick, Jay, and then let you please, go. Please, no, please no, go. For I, it, please, I was gonna please. mention you because mm -hmm. when we got really into the thick of writing certain chapters, like mm -hmm. towards the tail end, we were hitting like late chapters. 
and there are multiple mm -hmm. points where you're like, Gertrude has gone through a little bit more of a confidence boost, so maybe she wouldn't react in that way. So, I mean, mm -hmm. even like the standard, um, like residents go through these changes mm -hmm. where you have to keep up with that consistency emotionally. Mm -hmm. Well, what's so tricky about Yazeva, so we have this, we have these spreadsheets on the back end that are like these giant sprawling spreadsheets that connect it all together. Um, and one of the, the things we have to do is basically that we don't know what order anything happens in, right? Like we don't know what chapter or played what. We can't explicitly reference another chapter, like right you know, with a chapter right after it, right? The chapters themselves are even in the book. They are not in numerical order. Like it's like chapter five, chapter eight, chapter three, chapter 12. Like they're kept out of order so that people are, don't try and treat them like a linear narrative. And what that means is that there's weird moments like that where it's like we can't reference Gertrude sleeping on the dryer mm -hmm. because technically she could at any moment move into a room and we don't want to disrupt that little bit of canon. But like it's it's she starts sleeping on the dryer in the laundry room. And so we have to play this little game where we have to choose our language carefully. But then also the flip side of that <laughs> is that by the time is that we, we've staggered the chapters. So they unlock, it's like, you can't unlock a late chapter without a circle sticker. And you get a circle sticker from these other chapters, which you need square stickers to unlock. And you get those square stickers from a starting chapter, right? So we've created a tech tree, effectively, a nonlinear tech tree. This is all M, by the way. This is M. Veselek, the, the co-creator, who did a lot of the, the, who did basically all the legacy system design elements. But she figured out that, you could have the, the 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 stickers be these tiers of unlocking. Um, and what that means is that the late chapters, even though we don't know what has gone on before they've gotten to the late chapters, we can assume that the characters have in some senses grown. And so we give them more maturity. We give them more reflection and more kind of awareness because even though we don't actually know the path that was taken, to get there, we know that there must have been a path before that point. And so that's kind of the, the art of it, uh, which has been like, again, you should see the spreadsheets. <laughs> like and I, like it's, a, it's like the number of cycles and patterns and tricks to all of this is like, it's like, it's, it's a, it's been an endeavor. Yeah. I, and I'm also imagining the person who's listening to our conversation right now, knowing not a lot about the game is like, wait, what are you talking about circle and square? Why do you need stickers? What are the spreadsheets? Um, I know. <laughs> which, which is fine. And those are all good and normal questions. And I, I want to say like, having having just stepped into a scene and played a chapter, it was very easy to step in because the way it's written makes it very easy to. So I do want to clarify to anybody who's out there listening, like, I don't get it. Um, talk to me a little bit about so maybe some of the more traditional mechanics, right? Um, so that maybe people who are watching this who don't who don't have a sense of that can get a little bit more of a sense of it. You, you, there, I know there's different like uh, emotions to each scene that kind of dictate maybe, maybe some of the core mechanics that you're using within that scene while some chapters are kind of also still just isolated under themselves. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the the tones and how that maybe, influences things maybe maybe the easiest way to to do it would just be to really quickly establish like the game is designed to be as easy to get into as possible mm -hmm. and the complexity of it it's almost like it's wide instead of deep if that makes sense like it's one of those like like brownies you know like 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 you know like like brownies made in a pan or like mm -hmm. a birthday cake and that like any individual piece is going to be fine, but it's really fucking big. <laughs> or, can I uh, Okay, yeah. You did. Um, yeah, I did. I, I did. Sorry if I can't. Um, it's really big. big. Um, and so, like, when you start playing the game, right, you, you, you pick a chapter, and the chapter has, like, a couple, there's, like, a page of rules, and you pick your characters, and you play that chapter, and that's all fine. And a different chapter might have completely different rules, but all you know the chapters kind of uh the, the way we kind of keep track of the chapters is that the chapters have themes throughout them which we call moods which basically mean that like for example every single chapter that's frantic in addition to being of a certain emotional tone narratively is also utilizing the same system mechanically um where it's using kind of this coin flipping system that we've created um to kind of s simulate these frantic kind of chaos um, and so once you learn one frantic mood, 
The other chapters are really easy to learn as well, but any of them also serve as a good introduction because you can pick up any of them. Or like the relaxed move uses belonging outside belonging tokens. And so it's really simple to get into and to, to utilize. Um, and you don't have to understand these larger patterns, but the goal of it, the, the hope of it that we've, I've, we've kind of talked about a lot is that like your first time playing is Ava's Ben Breakfast. Like I can't explain how liberating it is to do a one shot where it takes like 20 minutes to get from, from let's play the game to we are now in character playing, yeah. right? Like for those of you who have played one shots where it like takes an hour and a half before you actually start role playing, Yuzebas is the opposite of that. Yuzebas is quick and fast and comfortable. But <laughs> the trick of that is that you play that one shot and you learn those little rules. And maybe the next time you play, it's a completely different set of rules, but it's still quick and easy to learn those rules. And then over time, you get a sense of the patterns. And if you read the book, you get a sense of these larger patterns. And that's kind of the, the trick it utilizes, so that these patterns kind of provide security and comfort while navigating this very wide, very easy to get into space. It's a great way to articulate it. Um, Treasure Rama in the chat wants to know, uh, is there anything prohibitive from someone playing this solo? Um, so it was not designed for solo play which means that there are some chapters which by default call for more than one character. There are also like, I, I think like the chapters are not designed with solo play in mind, except for one chapter, which is about, uh, it's like a Gertrude's journal, uh, which is like designed for solo play. Cause you can just, it's, it's a journaling game from Gert from the main character's perspective. Um, but uh, you can, I think like, first off, it's a big book and it is a narrative and like the narrative's good. Um, and you can, we have an editor, LD Lewis, uh, who's a Hugo award-winning incredible uh, author who is the, the narrative editor. And her job is to just go in and make sure the, the narrative text is high quality. And so the book will be good to read. Um, and that's solo play, right? That's that <laughs> itself is solo play. You're just, you can just enjoy the book and yeah. like sit with it. And like, if you want to take a chapter as a prompt and write a journal exercise based on it, you can do that too. So I guess like Yosebus was not written with solo play in mind, but like, it's the sort of thing where if you get it and you don't have any friends to play it with, you are not going to be disappointed. You are going to be like, it has a lot for you. And I, and I think it's not, yeah. Stepping back to what you said, like the goal was to design it so that you could strip away all the mechanical pieces and play with any system. Mm -hmm. So if there's a solo game that you really like out there, you could easily just be like, okay, cool. I'm going to strip out that and I'm going to use the solo mechanics from this game to, to play through. Yeah. Cause like the one that we did, the, especially like, I, like I played a frantic chapter, frantic chapters deal a lot with the chaos between players. You wouldn't have that, but it wouldn't be hard to write a story or from a, from the prompt of the opening mm -hmm dialogue to talk about what each of the characters have done in the ongoing solo play that you've done based on how they've evolved and how they come into that space yeah. wouldn't be a hard so, stretch at all you know mm -hmm. and yeah, so you can, you, can, you can do solo play in the same way that like you know you can solo play star wars right <laughs> you can example, yeah. do it like so, <laughs> <hell yeah. laughs> um awesome um let's talk um also a little bit about uh, and, and this goes into like role for felicity says i can't wait to play this game with all my friends i may even use it to introduce some of my friends to ttrpgs right like um i am there's there's a lot of things i'm excited about that we won't get a chance to talk about uh that y'all have kind of in the works for for marketing and promotion and i do feel like one of the reasons i am so excited about yazibas is, is is the introductory capacity that's going to have to bring people into playing RPGs for the first time who may never have, who may only be familiar with the dragon game and nothing else, and therefore are experiencing a different type of play in a very different way for the first time. Uh, I think those are very beautiful things, and I love that Lily is a part of the team to be able to also like represent that on the design side and make sure that even from the core kind of pros and art elements along with the rest of the team, make sure like that voice is present, because I think we lose that a lot of times as gamey game designers. Like we lose the ability to see things through that eyes, which makes it hard to onboard people. But um, there are, there's a significant shift that you guys have made uh, with this one. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the move um, away from Kickstarter and over to Indiegogo and what some of the hopes and challenges for that might be? Uh, Me yeah. looking at you like I'm just- I know, like, okay. That's a J question. I was not expecting the <laughs> All right. 
Well, um, I mean, like, I'm like, we're on Indiegogo now. At this point, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like uh Kickstarter was like rude about it, and like Kickstarter has has now since you know taken back they're, they're, they've done take backsies on their blockchain or tried to. Uh and it's like, yeah, if you're in if you're familiar with what's been going on with RPGs or comics world or like any kind of like the 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 scenes the creative scenes of a lot of these spaces you know people are freaked out about what's happening with Kickstarter and blockchain we switched indiegogo because indiegogo gave us a good offer and part of what that meant was kind of this capacity to step away from kickstarter um it's been a fascinating journey the team at indiegogo has been super wonderful like we're gonna have them in our discord the day of launch so Mm -hmm. that if you're having onboarding issues, like if you can't get your account set up or whatever, there will be Indiegogo staff hanging out at Possum Creek, like to help you out and get you set up, uh, which is like, I don't know, a really neat thing to get to have. Right. And they're doing, you know, they're doing a ton of stuff with us and like, they really like us. So it's nice working with Indiegogo. Um, I'm frustrated that Kickstarter uh, launched this like, obnoxious vague confusing intention and then three months later rolled it back having already kind of blown a giant crater in a bunch of people's careers yeah. you know um but we have such an indiegogo and i do think it it is it is a good opportunity for us i'm hoping it goes well uh and i was only really able to make that choice with the support of the whole team you know like i feel like yeah there was a lot of people who who were able to kind of give good counsel and yeah um, and Lily, I do have a question for you in this, yeah. and that is like you you don't like for I think a lot of times like we oftentimes in in whatever scene we're a part of right where it's, it's it can feel like um, feel like some things are very big that the average individual who's not a professional within that scene may not may be like whatever like I don't care I I feel like this decision for Kickstarter had ripples in the like from what I saw in the independent arts community uh in comics in, for independent authors other things like that have you seen in some of the other communities you're a part of kind of the some of the same kind of responses um and have and have those conversations mirrored have they looked different what are some of the things that you're seeing beyond just the game space around this that laugh was just a capital Y. Yes, that's all that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, was, that wasn't meant to be condescending. It was just like, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, no, I don't, like Jay said, I don't think you can avoid it in any kind of art space. It's happening. It's happening with Gumroad, you know? And so it, it's just all about, yeah, that. So it's just all about staying aware and making informed decisions. And like you said, some people aren't able to up and jump ship. Um, so it's just about, making informed decisions and how much you're willing to stick around for how long and what you can do. But yeah, I've definitely seen it happening. Yeah. And I think I, from, oh, go ahead. I was just saying, I think that's a popular misconception that it is um, easier to uh, jump ship when you're a small creator than when you're a large creator. And people like there's a couple of people who have tried out Indiegogo and been like, wow, it didn't work for me. And I'm like, yeah dog we've got a lot more resources than yeah we're 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 trying to make it a space that will work we're investing resources into making a space that will work and like the unfortunate reality is that like it's the like you know possum creek is not the largest rpg company in the biz we are a little you know we're a little bit larger than solo production we're not you know we're arguably not indie anymore which whatever (laughs) i'll 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 reserve my comments i mean i would say y'all are Uh, still indie you're now small press and no longer solo solo exactly like it's not just little old me shipping out books from my living room (laughs) um but uh it is uh what do you call we are like um you know, like we we are more equipped to make Indiegogo a possibility. And my deepest desire, my hope, is that we can land an Indiegogo, make a big splash, and create kind of a space for a bunch of other creators to come in. Like we can be like the the bear, you know, breaking down the barricade with yeah. this with the you know, like boom, you know, like smash in there and then like open up the hole that everyone else can run through. Yeah. Um, because yeah, it's it's up to the it's up to the 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 like the larger you are, the less risk switching platforms is right like magpie could have made millions of dollars on their av- on the avatar project not on kickstarter right? right they they could have done that somewhere else and like i'm not saying mag you know magpie did not make a mistake by being on kickstarter i don't think they had an F- i think at that point it was totally reasonable they were on kickstarter um but like it is true right that these larger companies are the ones who are more empowered to make choices and the smaller 
smaller folks are the ones kind of stuck with whatever it works. Yeah. Um, and so what, what I hope to be able to do with, with our company's privilege is to just expand what is possible to work. And like Kickstarter just shouldn't have a monopoly on creative. Like it's, it's kind of ridiculous that we live in a world where if you want to make something creative, you have to go through this one platform. If you have any hope of raising more than a couple K yeah. like, you know, we shouldn't be, <laughs> It should not be this way. This is a bad way the world is. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's, it's one of the reasons like we made the jump over to GameFound was like, we are, and we are not at that same level, right? But it was, mm -hmm. we had a project that was set up. But I think some of the things that, that you and I have talked about, um, and that, that, and I keep on hearing like, and it's really funny. Like, I think even when you were like, yeah, Indiegogo reached out, there are people who are like, oh, so like people reach out to people and like, da, 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 and like there are people who wanted to be whatever about that. And I'm like, but like the reality is, I, I cultivate relationships with people in the games industry. Yeah. And so like when I wanted to get on GameFound, um, I didn't think it was a possibility until a friend was like, hey, we're looking for more people to go on GameFound. Do you have anything or do you want to know someone um, who yeah. just, and he works for them part time, right? This is Ryan. Yeah. And so um, like cultivating those relationships matters. And that for me was like kind of an answer to thing. You have a better reputation as uh, as a small press creator um, who's who has had some some big success in the last uh, year and a half, especially around Wander Home, that that made that an attractive piece uh, to to Indigo to come to you. But I also think like the the big thing to me in all of that is GameFound, Indiegogo, a lot of the other platforms are desiring to show uh, games on tabletop. Same thing, right? Uh, they want to show a human face to you and say we are people and you are people. And you're a creator and we're, we're a funding platform and we want to look at you person to person and say, how do we help you and support you? And I think almost every other funding platform besides Kickstarter desires to have that human touch. I have always encouraged people to, when writing emails to the games community at, at the games team at Kickstarter, to, to talk to Anya, to talk to John, to talk to them like they're humans. It, but it's very hard when from Kickstarter creators are not treated the same way in reverse. Like when we're yeah, like, and it's like, yeah. And it's like Anya's totally a person. And like, you know, if Anya reached out to me being like, hey, can we talk about the whole Kickstarter blockchain stuff? Like, I would have loved to sit down with her and had a conversation and been like, oh, I guess, you know, you've convinced us to stay. Like, she had the opportunity. She had the capacity. I warned, I alerted Kickstarter that we were leaving and they were like, bye. Right. So like, that's just as much on them. That's the response, you know, it is their responsibility to communicate with me. I, they have my email address. I, you know, <laughs> and that's, and again, that's, that's not to put blame on John or Anya or anybody, any individuals yeah, yeah. in the organization, but there is an yeah. organizational choice that's happening there. Uh -huh. um, and there are people who left Kickstarter because they didn't like what was happening um, around this. Yeah. And so it's a choice everybody's going to make. Uh -huh. And like I said, it's not, a, it's not, it's not to denigrate those individuals, but I, I always yeah. want people to be approaching the people in that platform as if they're individuals, I'll be able to, to identify if that platform isn't approaching us in the same way, there's an imbalance there. And when those imbalances exist in any relationship, it's time to, it's time to make a change in that relationship. Um, and so I, uh, I'm loving seeing you also found Indiegogo. I'm loving seeing more people get onto game found. I'm loving seeing games on tabletop, get more action from the U S and EU scene. I'm also loving Gian funding the snow queen just totally independently and bats who has set up slow funding over on the nerve store that Amanda <laughs> is now funding uh, her project there. And it's the second one they're doing like seeing that decentralization to me has been such a great part of all of this. And, and regardless of it's the way we want it to happen, it's going to be a good thing for the scene. I, I, I feel like the kind of backpedaling Kickstarter did for this one was more like, oh, people are leaving and it's okay and they're doing fine. Wait, 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 wait. Now we should care. But I do know from conversations that, that Jay and I have both been a part of in a couple of different discords that there is a desire to have a little bit more of that human contact on the team side from Kickstarter. So I do want to say uh -huh. the people there care whether the company yeah. does or not. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. And I, I really, I, I don't think it's like a, like, I don't think if, if you, if we decided to do Yazebas on Kickstarter, I don't think we would have made a moral failure. Right. Like mm -hmm. genuinely, if it was just, if, if the only thing that pushed us away from Kickstarter was a moral question, we would not have left Kickstarter. Yeah. And that is because of the fact that, we are a team of a dozen plus marginalized people who could really fucking yeah. use a break, right? right, right, right. <laughs> like I want to be able to write a fat check to everyone on the team at the end of the day. 
And I don't want to make like if, if it was just my paycheck, I would have switched to whatever. I would have done whatever. But it's never been just my paycheck. It's always been everyone. And like at that situation, it's like we're not looking at is Indiegogo the morally better choice? We are looking at a complex pros and cons list. It includes morality, but also includes press. That also includes community. That also includes, you know, like just platform support. That includes all these factors. And we weighed the numbers and we we felt that Indiegogo was the best option. But that was like a conclusion we had to come yeah. to. You know, that was not just, it was not just a moral question. And I, I worry for people who are making the choice on a purely moral level, because I think that like they're like if you're a hobbyist i think making it the choice on a moral level is a good idea but i think that for many of us especially when we depend on games for our income the purely moral option unless you are able to leverage a lot of time or resources in order to make it work can be dangerous for you yeah but no shade to the people who are doing it morally i think you're fucking awesome i just think that you know, I think that it is a very complicated equation. Yeah. And I think for um, me, the I, thing, I think sometimes people just hop into the to the dangerous, you know. And I want to see people doing the work and making an intentional choice, which I think y'all have. And I think that's what we need to celebrate, regardless of whether anybody's at. Like, uh, yeah. when, especially when and people don't get this at your point, like people are like, y'all and Gauntlet were like, contracts have already been signed. And people are like, what contracts? And I was like, uh, backer kit, right? Like, like, at, like there's a lot <laughs> backer of. Kit. Back at stuff I can't even talk about yet. There's right. No, no, I, I understand. I, I don't. Yeah, yeah we won't yeah. talk about the other stuff. You can't. Yeah. Talk about. I know. I know. Monday, Monday. People check my Twitter on Monday. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a goddamn press release. Ah, I'm so I, excited about Monday. I, I can't talk about it yet. I feel like um Sophie from House Women Castle, where like when she tries to talk about the witches, <laughs> I'm like. Mm, you're gonna really like it <laughs> we have a press release coming on monday that's gonna i think really blow people's minds open so you know yes but yes exactly I, yeah i'm i'm so excited about all the things that are going to work for this game uh i think i think mm -hmm. there's gonna be a lot of things like i said that do tremendous things in in the indie rpg space because of this game and again i think i think we have to think about when we're creators um and this kind of goes back to some of the core of what we were just talking about but everything like when we're designing games, there are a lot of choices that we're making. And um, I think at the end of the day, what I want to see is games that are building up the community and uplifting the community that are that are excellent games, but that are also doing something more. And I think um, Yazeeb is, is going to be such a perfect articulation of what good and intentional game design can do, not only for the creators, not only for the players and the GMs, uh, but also for the community as a whole when we're pursuing things in that way. And there's a lot of creators out there doing it. Like Possum, Possum Creek does it well. That's why I love I love getting a chance to hang out with you, talk with you, uh, support the work that y'all do, but. I wanted to really quickly, before we before we wrap up, one person did have a question, which I thought would, would be good to oh, answer. Yeah. Oh, no, um, I was going to get to those also, too, yeah. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay, sorry, I just... No, if you saw it, you can yeah. go ahead and say the question and say it out loud, though. Oh, okay, I was going to say, um, uh, Treasurama asked, without being too on the nose, what is the current plan in terms of book size, turnaround time, etc.? Which I forget, I wanted to make sure I answered because it's very, you know, that's a that's a, that's a that's a good that's a good one to to talk about. Which is just uh, the book. We have a few different models for the book, including you know, like we're going to be doing a hardcover. I think it's the core thing. Hardcover is going to be around 500, 600 pages. Uh, hardcover eight and a half by ten. It's going to be a big chunky boy. Uh, and we've also got you know digital plans. Uh, Monday. Uh, we have a box set. We're going to be doing print on demand with drive through RPG so that people can get it for cheap. And like, if they want to tear up the book, they can do that. Um, you know, if you just want to spend like 20 bucks to destroy a book, you can do that. Yeah. It's a big old book. Uh, yeah. it's definitely a big old book. I, um, I remember when Jay was first like, Hey, I've got this thing. I'm really excited about Will you read it. And I was like, sure. <laughs> you sent me 20,000 words of draft. <laughs> and by the time I got to it, there was like another three or 4,000 words that had already been added on that. Like, and it's gotten so yeah. big and so beautiful. I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> i mean like grub knows about that right <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Grub, grubs knows how big it actually is it's 120 000 words is the full mm. length of the thing yeah actually, which is a monstrous object but again it's wide it's easy to get into there's a lot to swim through uh and turnaround time turnaround time is going to take a bit and the reality for that is because we haven't started editing the book so after the indiegogo there's a few months for editing there's a few months for 
lay out. And then there's like, once the PDF is done, it'll take six months to convert that into a printed object. So we're hoping to get it. We're, we're generously giving ourselves June, 2023 for release, like for physical release, which, you know, is both good for us on a health level. Like we don't crunch. We really try hard not to crunch, except for me, I get crunched, but no one else, no one else should get crunched. Um, I'm like, I'm like the little, like, I'm like, I'm just like, I'm a little juice press and everyone else <laughs> It's gonna be okay. Um, but uh we're hoping for June 2023. Um we've yeah, that, that and, that's and the good news is, about that timeline is also global paper supply may have recovered, shipping may have like yeah, hopefully there's a lot of things we plan. hope are better yeah. by then. And so yeah, exactly. Barring a collapse of the United States in its entirety. But mm -hmm. you know, I feel yeah. like we can't we can't plan around that stuff. Awesome. Uh, if anybody has any more questions for Lily or Jay, go ahead and drop them in the chat. We'll take a moment to talk about those. I want to encourage. I'm going to turn on my lights really quick. Give me yeah. one second. I want oh yeah, I didn't. People again. Oh no, you're so good. To, I just realized. I was like, go to ttrp or tinyurl. That is Zabas BNB to check it out. I'll drop that link in the chat uh, in just one moment. Again, I do want to tell you about a couple things that we have uh, coming up though here on the channel this evening. Uh, it's a double stream day. We're going to sit down from the with the team from Tiny Tome, which is an anthology of fifty one page RPGs uh, that have been put together um, that were uh, part of a one page jam that happened last. Um, last year over on itch um it's part of zine month we're going to talk to four of the creative team members uh from that about their creations what other ones they love and again some more zemo projects that they are excited about uh they tossed out some new ones that no one has brought up yet but it's gonna be this evening uh it says at 7 p.m eastern time that a hundred percent should say at 8 p.m eastern time because that's when it's going to be happening uh so come back this evening at 8 p.m uh, eastern Hell time yeah. to check that out i'm very excited uh, tomorrow we are going to be playing Pirate Borg, which is a standalone Merc Borg hack. Um, and so it is all the grim darkness of Galgenbeck, but in a completely different setting thrown under the high seas with a new stat added called Spirit that uses you use to command your spells instead of just presence. Um, but uh, I'm very excited to be sitting down with the creator uh, to play that game and be able to experience uh, Merc Borg in an entirely new context uh, and setting. Um, I feel like there's other things I should be talking about also. Probably uh, the Together Probably. We Go Jam uh, is coming up at the beginning of March. This is going to be a month of encouraging people to create content for Down We Go uh, through the Void or DungeonDelvers.tv or create their own standalone games using the Together We Go system, which is um, a rules light OSR, um, a post OSR system that's really about narrative dungeon crawling and emergent anti canon uh, hooks. It's super great at the table. And if you've never experienced, uh, OSR or just dungeon crawling in a way that you enjoy, I'd really encourage you to check out the content that's going to be coming out of that jam uh, and those systems. We publish them, so there's a total bias there, but I also do absolutely uh, love them. And just a reminder, we've got 13 Hunters live right now um, over on GameFound at ttrpg.link slash uh, 13H. Uh, here we go. Here's the real questions coming through, the hot questions. Everybody wants to know. Um, the link is expired. I don't know if that's a question for us. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me which that's link it is. Like Tell me which link it is, and I'll I'll get you the right one. Um, uh, do y'all have a favorite character from the book? Who's your favorite character, Lily? How about you first? Oh, okay. I will say a guest, and then I'll say a resident. Surprisingly, I think my favorite resident is Parish. I really like Parish. Tell us a little about Parish. Will I? No, okay. So Parrish. <laughs> no, I don't no. think I will. Next no, no, no. <laughs> so Parrish is the um, bread and be eh, the bread and bed and breakfast cook. He's the chef. Um, but he is a toad and he was turned into a toad. He used to be a knight. Um, and I just find it really compelling. I think before when I initially like got a grasp of Parrish, I was like, okay, it's like the standard like used to be nobility has now been shifted magically into this like humbled animal. But I think when you like do research on what it means to be a knight and like the regality of all of that, and then to have this kind of subservient role, but to not be kind of pissy about it. <laughs> like he has a really great attitude. He really loves what he does. I don't know, I like Parrish, which surprises me. And for guests, Again, like you said, Tony, I am biased, but uh, Vera Odadai, I really like. I love Vera. It's very Scorpio energy. 
I love Vera. I recently wrote um, a little snippet of text that involved Vera. I should send it to you because yeah. I feel like it's very your shit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my favorite resident um, is Hey Kid, who is a demonic child that was left on the front door of the bed and breakfast as a baby uh, and uh, has grown up to be kind of the 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 the, the community like mascot slash incredibly ADHD 10 year old like demon child. And the reason I love them is because um, the text doesn't really tell you how they grow older, but instead as you play, they've got these wildly diverging options for how they grow older. Um, and so uh, it's really cool to that. Like basically when you play with Hey Kid for a while, after you know enough people play them and after they've had enough time to change they will be their own teenager but they will be a very different 13 year old than someone else's hey kid right like that they will grow older but the the way in which they'll grow older will be uniquely them for that instance for that book and so i love that about hey kid that not only are they like a very sweet charming character who i adore but also that their arc means that emotionally they become very different um and uh Ooh, thank you. Um, and then my favorite guest, I think, uh, is oh, there's so many guests. I think it's Agate Aventurine, who is mm. this uh troll, um, who was once Yazeba's bed and bre- Yazeba's. See, it's best hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, uh, B B and B B B F. B B F. Uh, Agate was Yazeba's best friend when the two of them were younger. But Yazeba had to sell her heart in order to um, create the bed and breakfast. And so she lost kind of her ability to to love the people around her. And most of her friends left her and she had to like make new friends, basically. But Agate is like the one friend who continued to care for her, even when she got like bitter and cold. Um, which is and like it's just this beautiful troll. And we recently got the art for it from from Val Wise, who role for Felicity is 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 partially com- uh, like the incredible fat characters just throughout the game. It's you know, yeah, and it's really just a yeah, I love I love Agate. Also Vera really quick cuz Lily I don't think you mentioned Vera's deal. Vera yeah. is is the Night Porter's ex and she's this <laughs> deep sea mermaid. She's so she's so good. I like love I love her. I love her. I love her like both on her own and that Sal has an ex who visits the bed and breakfast <laughs> and that. is like like what a devastating thing to be working at your job and have your ex-girlfriend come in and be like, yeah, I'd like to stay at the bed and breakfast. Here. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, could you check me in? Mm-hmm. And also just like yeah. the, the coral, yeah, right? And like the coral hair, like there's a lot of like deep sea yeah. uh, physical characteristics attached mm-hmm. to her, like hidden fangs. It's so good. I love her. Mm-hmm. And the way her, her journey, if I remember right, is about like does she go all in on being bitter to sal or does she figure out how to be her own person which is such Mm. a beautiful like i don't know like just such a good a good little moment to have in a side character effectively i love i love vera yeah um but yeah those are our favorite characters and yeah as as pro at role for felicity said not a question but just wanted to say that with the art of you say was coming out i really love that there's are that there are fat characters uh i'm fat emma's fat grubby is fat a lot of the team is fat um we like uh we really wanted to make sure that it was a game that accurately reflected like what it, what our life experiences were like and i find it so goddamn unnerving when like i've been playing a lot of hades uh which is mechanically a very interesting game but the more i play the more unnerved i feel by the endless parade of skinny bodies and how the only character who in any way looks like me is like a monster that you kill on the first level and it just feels very um weird um and it was like yeah it was important to us that the game accurately like like that the main character is not just a trans girl but she's a fat trans girl right that you know like that sal isn't just you know like he's not just a trans guy he's a fat trans guy right at least that like there, there are characters who are fat throughout the game and that was really important and like that even to the point where it's like there is enough diversity that there's different types of fatness, which you don't get in media. You right. don't realize that there are different kinds of fat bodies, but we get to have that. So I, I'm really, that's a really good art direction thing that Grubby and M kind of worked together to make sure happened. 
And it, I really love it. <laughs> I really, it's genuinely impacting the way I relate to my body because I've, you know, yeah, yeah. I struggled with self, you know, I've, I've complicated feelings with my body. Of course I do as a fat trans person and seeing it all there is really nice. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, the, the character design has been amazing and watching the way mm -hmm. that the world has been visually built mm -hmm. has been absolutely stunning. Every time I show mm -hmm. people like some people links, they're like, the art on this is amazing. And so um, I just love mm -hmm. that it's drawn people. But I, I do think it is, it is humongously important and something that I know there's plenty of people who never think about. So I, I always want to encourage people like uh, for like role for Felicity uh -huh. uh, and others who, when you see that, and that matters to you, make sure you're naming it. Um, like uh -huh. make sure you're lending your voice to that. Cause it lets creators know how important that is for people to see, uh -huh. um, which I mean, nobody should have to be told that, but like we shouldn't have to be told a lot of things. And I always value when, uh, even, even as somebody who is, um, who is, you know, a, a cis white male, um, who, who does a hundred percent have weight, uh, management issues and body image issues. Um, like it always matters to me when I see people who look like me, um, in, in things. And that primarily comes down to my weight. Um, and so I, um, I get only a very small insight into that. Um, and I also know like lots of times when those choices get made, um, people, almost don't mention them because they don't know if it's okay to add their voice to it. And I just really appreciate Felicity saying that and y'all creating space for that also too. So thank you so much. Um, the, um, um, if anybody has any more questions, there There's we go. One more, uh, one more <laughs> are there any parts of the books that might be less obvious on the first reading that you're really excited to have put into it? I know this answer, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know if I should say it. I think you should. I think you should. Do you? Are we in sync? Do you know what I? I think I am. Go for it. Say yes. it. Say okay. It. House. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Let's talk about house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Talk about house a little bit. Okay. Cool. So, um, I think it was specifically designed for this to be a feature once you've reached the end of the game, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's like it's a thing that you have to kind of struggle to find because it's going to be mm. hidden in the book we have we have some hidden surprises throughout the game and that's why lily and i were a little <laughs> i was like do we do we technically this is a this is a guest that is hidden inside the book that you have to like kind of track down and figure out where they are mm -hmm. uh in the text of the game itself but if you find them you can you can play with them yeah so so spoilers for this rpg <laughs> ahead uh but uh do you want to talk a little bit about house and uh that having that in the game yeah, so uh, give two seconds for people to mute if they don't want to hear this. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> now that they're gone. Um, so oh. the actual uh, bed and breakfast is its own playable character in the game uh, mm -hmm. with its own personality. The personality and Jay can like come in being like um, kind of a conduit for uh, Yezebel's subconscious emotions. So if Yezebu feels a certain way, the house will like rumble, floorboards will creak, doors will slam in order to correspond to how she's feeling. And also the house being like a physical manifestation of Yezebu's heart still. And so having all of this care still in this object outside of Yezebu. So like Jay said, that's a guess that you'll have to like search in the book to try to find to play and to have it be a guess that's already assumed to be like an inanimate object, that it is still a playable mm -hmm. character. The the great magic trick of Yezebas, and this is also, I think, my answer to the question. The great mm -hmm. magic trick of Yezebas is that uh, it is a game which I think actually I'm going to read specifically what Avery Alder said about Yezebas, which I think does it really well. Which is um, on its surface, Yezebas Bed and Breakfast is telling slice of life stories about lovable rascals and their particular eccentricities. That's already beautiful. But what I love most about Yuseba is this Avery Alder, not me, uh, is the other story it tells, the secret one that only emerges over time, the story of what the world would be like if a place that couldn't possibly exist started existing and the people who needed it most always managed to find it. And I think the secret of Yuseba's is that uh, it is a game about uh, like having fun and getting up to mischief and like goofing around. Uh, but the more you play it, the more you really fall in love with the characters and the more the world, I think, opens up to you. And that, I think, is kind of the magic to me that uh, it's a game which is both 
like it's sweet and heartfelt and i think that it is easy to to look at it and assume you know kind of like bubblegum pop children's television fair but the reality is much like a lot of children's television when you would spend hours watching it you would you would saw you know the butterfree episode in pokemon you know that kind of like mm. it would get to you emotionally after a while and i think that mm. is the magic is that it 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 it, it gives you something soft and then it, it lets you fall very very deep um and really fall in love and like really learn the the subtle like uh, and not just learn that the characters are very complicated in their own way but you get to feel their own complexity in your own interpretation and by the end of it once you've played it enough you feel in control of the game that you can add to the game you can that you know ultimately it is fan fiction of a thing that doesn't exist and so you too can write fan fiction for a thing that doesn't exist awesome love it um, what a great place to kind of uh, end on. Um, I love those words. Um, if you want to see what this looks like in play, um, I know there's some other great ways you're going to be able to access that coming up uh, to see or hear it. But we are going to be playing mm -hmm. it here on stream uh, on, dang it, I was just looking at it, the 16th or the 12th or whatever that Saturday is, uh, the 12th yeah. of, uh, of March at 2 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon. That's a Saturday. If that's not a Saturday date, it's whatever Saturday is closest to that. Um, <laughs> and so um, please come back over for that. Uh, if you want to hit um, uh, follow to know when we go live, that's great. You can check out all of our past videos over on our YouTube channel. Uh, but Lily and Jay, it's been so great to have you with us. Uh, this has been Prestige Class with Lily, Jay Harris, and Jay Dragon. And until next time, class is dismissed. Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye. See ya. <laughs>